Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia, and thank you very much for joining us. I'm Laura Kovacs, and I'm pleased to be here. Caitlin Greenidge's debut novel, We Love You, Charlie Freeman, examines the nuances of race, gender, and history through the story of a family teaching sign language to a young chimpanzee. Her novel was a New York Times Critics Choice for 2016, a finalist for the New York Public Library's Young Lions Award, and on the shortlist for the Center for Fiction's first novel prize. Her nonfiction work has appeared in numerous publications, and she is a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. She joins us this evening with her much anticipated second novel, Liberty. Ms. Greenidge will be joined in conversation with Salamisha Tillett, the Henry Rutgers Professor of African American Studies and Creative Writing at Rutgers University, and author of In Search of the Color Purple, the story of an American masterpiece. Thank you all so much for being here. The screen is all yours. Um, I'm going to read a little bit before we start our Q&A. Um, and so I will just say um, this novel takes place during um, right before the Civil War, during the Civil War and right after. So um, it follows Liberty, who's a young girl at the start of the book in the in the 18 in 1859, 1860. Um, and her mother is um, Dr. Catherine, uh, Kathy Sampson who's based on Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart, the first black female doctor in New York state. Um, and I'll talk a little bit, I guess we'll, we can get into sort of how I sort of found her backstory, but um, all you need to know for this section that I'm gonna read from is that um, this section takes place during the civil war. Um, Liberty and her mother live in an all black township, all black free township in, in Brooklyn. Um, they've just experienced the draft riots, which was a, um, uprising in um, 1863 when white mobs in New York City attacked uh, Black Manhattan cultural institutions, churches, um, villages and settlements, um, burnt down the Black orphanage in Manhattan, and then also went after white sympathizers to Black people. So um, Liberty and her mother in this part of the book, they've just sort of seen a bunch of the survivors come and her mother and the women in town are trying to figure out what they're going to do next. It was hard planning, oftentimes hours of talking with no clear answers. But when the women got going, the whole room began to vibrate. Sometimes it seemed that the white walls themselves flushed when the women raised their voices. How strange it was to sit around them at their feet or in the corner and hear them shout. These same women who all week long told me and the other colored girls in town to speak softly, to keep our heads down and our backs straight to train our eyes to overlook the insults the world outside of town heaped at our feet. Those women told girls like me to ignore the present day horrors around us, to look only toward the future, toward another place that did not exist yet. But here in the room, I could imagine that I was already there. The women would begin the meeting sitting upright, but by the end, they would be sprawled, leaning against seats, arms crossed over stools, sipping water, laughing, shouting back and forth. You knew a meeting was getting work done when Miss Dinah began her sharp, piercing giggle. It was uncontrollable, a little hysterical and did not necessarily prompt the other women to join in. It was more like the whistle of a tea kettle. It told you pressure was high, waters were rolling to a boil, that something was happening and that whatever it was, it was as wondrous and yet as deceptively common as water transforming into air. I have never in my life felt anything as powerful as whatever force was in that room while those women talked. And I began to believe that it was the talking itself that did it, that perhaps women's voices in harmony were like some sort of Flintstone sparking or like the hot burst of air that comes through a window billowing the curtains before rain. Sometimes I imagine the whole room lifting up from their talk lifting up and spinning out, out into the future times to come when everyone would be truly free, the time I thought we were all planning for. To bring them back down, when a work day was done, they would turn to some sort of amusement. It had to be something calming, something sober. We need to rest a little in order to keep going, was what Miss Annie always said. They decided on trading compliments. 
They'd write them down on slips of paper, unsigned, but addressed to the lady they wished to compliment and then put them in an old flower tin mama had. At the end of the meeting, they'd draw the slips out one at a time and read the ode. And then the fun began in guessing the author. Everyone saved their praise by passing the compliments into little, by pasting the compliments into little books they stitched together and then passing them around to be signed by every lady present, a record of attendance. They made bindings out of the rags they had, they had around stuffed into the bottom of their sewing baskets, friendship albums, they called them. Everyone's album started neat and clean and pretty, of course, but it was every woman's goal to have a ruined one, a book with worn pages and extra leaves stuffed in, one bursting at the seams because that showed how loved you were. Mama was jealous of the other women. Sometimes at the end of a meeting, I caught her fingering the pages of her own album, looking from hers to theirs. Hers was always a bit neater, a bit cleaner and much thinner. Even after all she'd done for the orphans, even as the group conspired about how to make her a hospital, even after all that work, Mama would lift the other women's heavier books and sign them, smiling, while only a few of them signed hers. I suppose I should have been angry at the other women on behalf of Mama. If I was a loyal daughter, I would have felt that. But at the end of every meeting, I looked at Mama's thin book and only felt sorry for her, not mad at them. I did not know what to do with a vanquished mama. I saw her hurt, but I still thought she could overcome it. She never spoke of it to me. It was another thing to add to the load she carried. Everyone has their own burden liberty, she was fond of telling me whenever I complained about my inability to do arithmetic or when another girl was mean or petty. So I thought she could solve this setback, that it was temporary, that it was something mama could fix with her cleverness. Once in her office, I found the discards of her attempts at praise for the other women written on the backs of notes to the pharmacist and on the discarded labels of old medicine bottles. You've done fine work and I look forward to your work improving even more. Although at first I was not sure, I see now you are a true Christian woman. It was as if she could not, in spite of herself, break her reserve and warmly compliment any of these women who discarded her from their care. You see, I'm not very talented at this. I started. Mama was standing behind me, watching me read her weak words. I think it was the first time she admitted a failing to me. I felt a little flush of embarrassment for her. Liberty, she said, write something for me, kind but not too kind, nothing that would inspire envy. You cannot do it. I do not have a way with words like you do, she sighed. Then she said very quietly, the only good poem I've ever written is you. A daughter is a poem. A daughter is a kind of psalm. You in the world responding to me is the song I made. I cannot make another. My heart filled but quick, quickly sank because what freeborn thing can bear to be loved as much as that? The least I could do was write a poem for her. I'll stop there. Thank you so much for your book um, and for your wonderful reading. I have so many questions for you. So I um, guess we'll just start. And I've also you know, had the opportunity to hear some of your, your process and how you use the archive. So I would like to, to talk about that. I guess I'll wait, maybe begin with that. So I, I have a question for you though, in terms of did the historical, um, well, I, did Liberty come first to you or did um, Dr. Sampson come first to you? Or, and, and, and if, and that kind of determines my second question, but did the narrator, the main character, or did her mother come first to you? Um, that's an interesting question because I came to the story through the archives. So like I, I did an oral history where I talked to the descendant of Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart, who was the first black female doctor in New York state. Um, one of her descendants is a soap opera actress named Ellen Hawley. She wrote a wonderful genealogy of her family called One Life um, that's still in print that I highly recommend people read. Um, and I did an oral history with her and sort of talked to her about her family thinking that it would be an oral history about all of sort of the illustrious members of her family because um, her uh, do the doctor's father, Dr. Susan Smith McKinney's father was Silana Smith who founded Weeksville, this free black community in Brooklyn that still has a museum dedicated to this day. That's where I was working. Um, then you have the doctor, then you have sort of all these other members of the family, including Ellen Holly herself, who um, was a, a actress in, in the forties and fifties and then became a soap opera, opera actress. So I thought this was gonna be a, an oral history sort of about this, you know, black excellence family. 
And um, instead she sort of, she did talk about them, but then she also told us about this, this the doctor's daughter, this woman, Anna, um, who didn't necessarily make it into the historical record in that way, but was a, a huge part of their family's historical record because she had married the son of the Episcopal Archbishop of Haiti. It was a very tortured marriage. They had all these letters from her to her mother, from her mother to her, from her to her family in Haiti, sort of tracking this marriage. And um, she was able to break free of it with the help of her mother. Her mother helped her sort of escape. And for the rest of her life, she lived in New Jersey with her children, never returned to Haiti, never reconciled with her husband, never married again, but told her children about how much she loved the country of Haiti. She loved living there, um, but she would get these letters from her in-laws sort of saying, um, you, are, uh, you must come back to the family and you not being a part of this marriage anymore is not only a personal failing, but it is a judgment on all of uh, you know, black excellence at the turn of the century. So, um, you know, all these arguments that we're trying to make that black people are worthy, you know, Du Bois is talented 10th, you leaving this marriage means you're invalidating all of this. And so Ellen Holly sort of was very compassionate and, and sort of said like, can you imagine the courage that it would have taken to hear that from your community, know that probably 90% of the people in the world think that about you and choose to leave that marriage anyways. And she was very sort of like this, I, I draw strength from this woman um, who may not have made it into sort of the bigger historical record, but is a part of her family. And so I thought that's so interesting. And so I, both of them came to me at once, the mother and the daughter. And I, I, I decided, I think pretty early on though, I decided to sell, tell the story from the point of view of liberty as, uh, of the daughter. So now I have lots more questions after that. So why um, tell, I guess what's fascinating to me, and, and I do a lot of um, political work and organizing on behalf of black girls. Mm -hmm. And so what I really appreciate about your book is that you're really, um, one, you know, you're in the tradition of of our greatest writers, um, and Al Walker and, and Morrison and um, uh, Lord, who, who were really trying to give us the interior life of black girls as part of their foremost works. And so, um, but then you're taking us back um, to, to the 19th century, which is a different kind of subjectivity. Um, so what was the challenge, I guess, for you to reconstruct an interior life of a black girl in New York in the mid to, to, to late 19th century? Yeah, I think my biggest challenge was making sure that I wasn't um, grafting sort of like our modern sensibilities on that time period, um, while also making sure that I was writing a character who felt unique and distinct. Um, so for me, the challenge was always sort of like this character, she's going to be a freeborn Black girl um, in, in the North. And so that means she's going to be sort of like at the intersection of a bunch of different privileges and identities. And her mother is a doctor and she's, she herself has an education. So she's going to be at the intersection of all these different privileges and identities. Some of them that, um, we sort of understand and some of them that I can't possibly understand. And, um, I just sort of kept coming back to that relationship between her and her mother. And, um, reading those authors who came before me who were who have done so much work around uh, the state of black girlhood sort of across time. Um, you know, big inspiration or, or one thing that sort of like broke open the character of Liberty to me as I was reading um, a Tony K. Bambara essay and she talks about how much she um, credits her mother for making her an artist because when she was a child, she used to lie on the kitchen floor on her back, looking up at the ceiling, sort of thinking and dreaming, and her mother would mop around her. And she has, she sort of says like that, what a gift that was to, to just have somebody see you do that and mop around you. And that image sort of like broke it open to me. I was like, wow, that's, that's, there's, there's a whole history. There's a whole love. There's a whole complicated dynamic, not even complicated dynamic, just in, intense care in that very simple image um, that also sort of challenges some of the stereotypes about living in the body of uh, as a black girl and um and i just i love that and that really opened it opened the door for me <clears throat> i love that because i'm reading a lot of tony kibambar right now for a project so that was just uh not serendipitous kismet i suppose so, so thank yeah. you for that that image for me personally thank you for that image from <laughs> um 
So a couple of years ago, I did a conversation. Um, it was like a roundtable conversation um, about reconstruction and everyone else were, were historians and I was the literary critic. And so I went back to an essay that my uh, dissertation advisor, Skip Gates had written about the reconstruction era. One of the arguments that he makes in this essay in terms of the historical record is that you know, during slavery, for obvious reasons, there was a proliferation of slave narratives, right? Like these literary, both both novels, but then also the narratives themselves. And then, and and then with de jure um, uh, uh, Jim Crow, uh, there's a return to the the novel, and there's a flourishing of works that. But in that period of Reconstruction itself, there's actually not a lot of African American uh, literary production, and so. Mm -hmm. Um, for us to have novels then that kind of return back to that period is really still fascinating because it's kind of filling in a, a missing literary record. Uh, and there, you know, we can think about the reasons why people weren't necessarily writing novels with the same fever. Um, but of course, for me, this brings up um, one of your icons and I guess all of our icons of, of Morrison and Beloved and the way in which um, that is a reconstruction era novel um, but that she's trying to uh, um, work through, um, remember, um, reveal the ways in which the, 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 the slavery is impacting the body and impacts the community. And so, I, you know, I, Morrison, I know is a, a lodestar for you in many ways, but what was it like to kind of think about what's at stake in, oh, oh my children, <laughs> what's at stake in reconstruction for you, this era in which there's so much possibility um, and yet, you know, we know what happens, you know, after Reconstruction. We know, we know that the nadir is about to come. But you're still in this moment of flux and fluidity and possibility. And you're also in, um, in the north, so maybe it doesn't have the same sort of um, tension as if you were writing about the south. I'm just curious about because it's just a fascinating period historically. But then, for for a writer, what, what did it allow you to do? Yeah, it's so interesting. I think I think we don't get as many novels about Reconstruction because um, in the I think American fiction is really interested in like a very particular type of arc of like arc of redemption or or sort of arc of of resolution. And Reconstruction period is is absolutely about a lack of res resolution. It's actually about sort of seeing time move backwards in a way that is like deeply anathema to how most of us are taught fiction to write fiction in the US. For that reason alone, it's fascinating to me. Um, you know, I think so much of about how Reconstruction mirrors to a scary degree our current political moment in that it was a time of intense Black achievement, you know, Black excellence, pe Black people breaking barriers sort of constantly every which way. Um, and then, as you said, that nadar is coming and and um, the intense racialized violence, intense white violence against Black people. Um, and yet when you read accounts from people of the time, like a, a big um, uh, influence on this book was, um, there's that really lovely uh, uh, and long history of, uh, DC era re black middle class reconstruction that came out a few years ago. I'm, it's, I'm forgetting what it was. I think it's called the other Washingtonians or something like that. Um, but anyways, that was a huge um, help to read. And I bring that up because in that book, there were sort of all these excerpts from black newspapers in, in DC at the time, sort of writing these op-eds saying um, uh, the death of racism, essentially, what they what they meant by, you know, they didn't actually use that word racism, racism, but the death of what we call racism is just around the corner because that generation, that older generation that's holding on is going to die off. And the younger generation that has seen the Civil War and seen what Black people are capable of, there's no possible way this younger generation of white and Black people, white people specifically, will go back to what we had before. There's just no way because because we've got, come so far. And that feels so much like the most of the writing I, from 2008 to probably about like 2013, 2014 in the era um, that was written sort of about race relations. And, and, and uh, I was so struck by that um, and so struck by that optimism and sort of belief in sort of the progress of time that reconstruction forces us to come up against. Um, you know, I was, I, I just did an interview with um, Alondra Nelson uh, uh, earlier today, and she was talking about like that um, 
fail and repeat that's necessary for scientific progress, that's necessary for artistic work, that's necessary for any sort of like scholarly work that you 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 fail at something and then you just sort of like repeat it. But it is it it and it's necessary for political work too. But like for some reason, especially in the US, we don't have narratives that that encompass that, that sort of like understand that. So that's what draws me to reconstruction. That's what drew me to sort of write this novel here. Um, and what makes me excited about writing about the period, time period. No, that's amazing. So Weeksville, I mean, I know you worked there for, was it 10 years? Did I make that up? Is that yeah, I worked there for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, 10 years. Well, my daughter is named Seneca after Seneca Village. Oh, cool. um, I love that. And, yeah. And so, I mean, I find these spaces of um, these kind of black free spaces to be um, not, you know, to, to return to them, to reimagine them. Um, and so I guess this is kind of a follow-up to the reconstruction uh, question because you're, you're, you're set in um, these, in Brooklyn and then you go to Haiti or not you, but you know, Liberty goes to Haiti and the book goes to Haiti. And so it seems to me that this, the question of what is a free black space, both a physical space and then also one in which it, you know, how does that kind of become internalized. There's like a tension between the the, the pl place being proclaimed as free um, yeah. and then the way in which the characters kind of exist and particularly black women characters can exist in it. So can you just talk a little bit about the location of uh, Liberty's journey and how the physical spaces or the um, geographical spaces um, are maybe one notion of freedom and, and then is is there tension? Am I misreading this? I guess is the question. No, no, that's the, exactly what it is. Yeah, I was, I was really struck. You know, one of the challenges that I gave myself when I was writing this was to write about Black freedom in these different spaces, um, the mm -hmm. U.S. sort of versus Haiti, and um, you know, throughout uh, um, Black American sort of intellectual history, there is always this dream of a of an all black utopia of an a, that we can escape to it that we can create it somewhere either within the borders of the US or outside of them. Um, and, mm -hmm. and that we've attempted to do that generation from generation attempted to sort of um, create these utopias. Um, and then that they, they get forgotten, you know, <laughs> like, like, yeah. or they, they get sort of, um, or, or they become so much a part of our, our uh, vernacular that they, they're just assumed and we don't even consume them as, as their original intent of, as a Black utopia anymore. And so that's what mm -hmm. I was super fascinated with, again, when I was doing the research, and I was reading those Black newspapers, they were all so fascinated and deeply invested in Haiti in the 19th mm -hmm. century, um, both before the Civil War and after the Civil War during Reconstruction because mm -hmm. Black people understood that Haiti was being used as, as an example of what Black governance was mm -hmm. could be possible. And so mm -hmm. Black people in the US, especially sort of Black intellectuals and Black politicians were so obsessed with Haiti um, and wrote about it constantly, deeply involved in the politics from afar, traveled back and forth, had constant conversations, um, and uh, and just were really sort of uh, uh, taken with the country. And so I just love that idea of, of where it could exist in someone's imagination in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, it, I sort of like, you're, we talked, you said a little bit earlier about like serendipity of, of, of research and stuff. I remember when I was working on the book at a certain point, reading some and coming across some of the research around all of these towns um, in the mid south, sort of like in South Carolina, um, that have sort of Haiti in their name that we don't even associate anymore that 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 that's why they have or, or parts of town that were black mm -hmm. area, areas of town that um, either are called some variation of Haiti or um, have callbacks to um, Haitian politicians' names. You know, all that stuff is sort of within our geography in the US, but we don't necessarily see it there. And so yeah. um, that's what I was really excited about to, to look at. And, and the idea of a space of Black freedom where the question sort of uh, in each of these spaces that we've tried to create is like how much of the dominant, um, uh, for lack of a better word, like white American cultures systems are we gonna take with us in this new space? And how much of this stuff are we going to completely reimagine? And in the 19th century from sort of reading the writings of, of black expatriates who went to Haiti, they were obsessed with recreating some version of sort of like white upper class political development in Haiti. Um, because they knew that that's what they were going to be judged against. So they're like, let's mm -hmm. try and copy that as much as possible. And, and it came down really to the role of women 
Um, you know, if we mm. can show that Haitian women can be made into good housewives, good housekeepers, which means they wouldn't leave the house, they wouldn't go to the market, they'd just sort of be inside housekeepers and men would be out sort of doing commerce as in as people sort of made up and pretended that was happening in sort of white spaces, um, then we can prove that we're civilized, right? That's how we can prove we're civilized. And, and it led to sort of this really weird sort of like colonizer logic that black people were bringing into that space and a lot of sort of like tension around that. Um, and I, I think though, you know, we can look back in the 19th century and say, so like, how were they able to think that way? But I think that type of thinking exists, you know, whenever you're talking about um, trying to create a, a Black utopia, you know, then it turns into sort of like the Black family and, and it gets patriarchal very, very fast. Um, and and it, it gets weird really quickly too. And so I just really wanted to sort of play with that, that thread over time. So. Yeah, I mean, I thought, well, it was just helpful. Thank you for bringing in the the archive because part of me was thinking, and, and I don't think this is the reference that you're bringing up, but then I was like, oh, this reminds me of some of the reasons why I love like Henry James novels because once you give the, the women characters a sense of freedom, like usually in his case, it's economic freedom, mm -hmm. then you get to see all the other ways in which like gender is constraining them because they have a mobility that other women in the society don't have. And so at Liberty, she has lots of, freedom so to speak and so then when she goes to to Haiti um what she's up against is something that's it's unfamiliar and restricting and so it makes you understand the U.S. differently but then also as you just point out what's what's being considered to be civilization is a reinstatement or reinscription of, of patriarchy I mean that's really fascinating and 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 what I and I'm going to just um and my question here and, and turn it over but I was interested in the fact that motherhood becomes a, a potential site of um and even your open your reading that you shared with us at the beginning and and the poem um and and the notion of freedom um being kind of given to her or inherited from her mother but that motherhood is a site of freedom which isn't always the case in a lot of um i'm just thinking of nella larson's yeah. quicksand for example it's like the exact opposite it's the, it's the ongoing trap and so um I don't know. I was curious what your thoughts on and on that was that partly based on the fact that you know these were inspired by real people or or um, or how do we imagine motherhood to be a potential site of freedom in the late nineteenth century? It's just an interesting um, yeah, thing that I, you posit for us. I was really struck with um, a Toni Morrison interview that she did in the eighties where she said motherhood would have been freedom for black women in the past and she was talking about like a very specific historical context of like if you are in a larger society that does not allow you any agency for yourself moving through the world um, assumes that you cannot make those decisions to be in a relationship with someone where you are shaping their worldview and how they move through the world is an is an intense form of power that the larger world doesn't give you and so becomes like this site of freedom. And so that tension I thought was just so fascinating. And then on top of it, I also just did not want to fall into the cliche of novels about motherhood in general sort of across time that sort of always sort of talk about it as this drudgery and, and terrible place where you know the, the self dies essentially um and then specifically novels about motherhood in the past oftentimes portray it that way as well um and you know liberty's mother or, or the doctor in the novel is an extremely privileged woman she has like a very privileged stance to to find motherhood as freedom and I'm not trying to make the argument that everybody in the past would have thought of it that way, but I did want to sort of explore what it what that might look like and what that might mean. And so I I tried to read as much as I could about um, different or alternative sort of ways of going about motherhood. Like uh, I read uh, you know Morrison, I read Grace Paley is another author who sort of has a, a different take on motherhood in her short stories and and sees it as part and parcel of, of political organizing and artistic work, they're all the same. Um, and, uh, and so I was really sort of struck by that. And um, I was also sort of thinking about someone like, you know, she's a little bit later time period, but someone like Ida B. Wells, who, you know, had many children, there's a sort of like accounts of her, including her children in her speaking tours. Um, you know, there's like that beautiful account of her um, in, 
introducing um, Harriet Tubman to like a group of people at, at Harriet Tubman's like 90th birthday party or something. And then handing her son to Harriet Tubman to sit on her lap and being like, he's the future. That's a moment that could not happen without her being a mother, you know? So like, I, I was really sort of struck about these alternative visions to being an ambitious woman, being a woman in the world while also being a mother. <clears throat> No, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, thank you for that. And um, I will turn it over to the audience now. So I think we have um, uh, from Miriam. I'm curious about the moment early in the book when Ben Daisy offends Liberty's mother and she decides to basically kick him out. I know the moment was charged, but I don't totally understand why. Was he showing Liberty's mother that some losses never leave us and that was too hard for Liberty's mother to handle? Okay. Um, close reader. Thank you. Mary. Yes, very close read. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think Ben Daisy is a character in the novel. When I was writing about Ben Daisy, I wanted to sort of um, so Ben Daisy. In case you have not read it, he is a formerly enslaved man. He's he's managed to escape from slavery. Um, how he's made it his, his escape is that he smuggled. Um, from uh, from slavery to Philadelphia Free State and then he, Phil, Free City and then he's taken further into Brooklyn and he's being smuggled in a coffin. Um, that's sort of like the way that they are, um, uh, you know, throwing off suspicion. And so it's incredibly traumatizing, right? He's he's, in a, he's he's stuffed into a coffin over the course of this sort of thing and 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 left sort of to his own thoughts and 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 feelings about what he's just lived through in slavery, and he comes out of that. Um, traumatized and because it is the 19th century they don't necessarily have the language to talk about what is going on with him but they know that something is up and the character of Ben Daisy for me was a way to explore the limits of care so um, Liberty's mother is a doctor she's dedicated to her community she's supposed to be caring for people but in Ben Daisy she has a patient who um, cannot be healed by any of the things that she has and, and in fact probably couldn't be healed by any doctor of the time period um you know is is and and is not only um you know wounded or or, or unwell but the way that his him being unwell happens is he acts out and he's hurting the other people in the community around him so for me i wanted liberty and both her mother to sort of wrestle with this question of like what are the limits of care um, what do we do with someone when they're in our community and they're they're acting like this? Do we shun them all together? Um, do we keep them in community? This is a highly fraught question if you're already in a marginalized community like their free black community is because to kick him out means to leave him to white people who are either gonna re-enslave him or just treat him terribly. So um, knowing that that's the larger tension that to kick him out means to essentially return him back to his original state but to keep him in the community means that he's he's really causing a lot of trouble and um making a marginalized community already even more vulnerable what do you do with that person um and so that's what the the whole trajectory is and each of the moments that he has in in conflict with liberty and her mother are is are turning that question over and over again <clears throat> thank you um so you talked about Haiti as a space for black freedom. And I wonder if there's a correlation, this is from Sherman um, Bagram, uh, Bagram uh, between Haitian freedom and the fact that the US has invaded the country more than any other. Oh, 100%, yes. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, that's what it is. It's like, it's Haiti was a literal um, visual promise of, of an alternative understanding of a freedom, a republic, liberty, right? Like um, so much of the US, you know, in, of our country is is hypnotizing ourselves with the myth of our own exceptionalism, with the myth of our own country making, with the myth that, um, you know, freedom could only have been gotten to and, and the end of slavery could only have happened in the way that it happened here. And um, Haiti is a direct rebuke to that. You know, it's the, it's the most successful slave rebellion um, that alone means that it was a threat to um, American uh, self-understanding, white American self-understanding. Um, so 100%. And and um, you know, I I think about it. One of the one of the things that was so fascinating to me when I was doing the research, um, I was uh, really lucky to sort of be at um, Radcliffe Institute at the time when when a 
a scholar of Haiti was there. And so he, we were, he took me to a lot of talks and stuff. And um, one of the talks that I went to, they were talking about Haiti sort of in, in the larger ima world's imagination right after the revolution. This is a very long story, I apologize. But um, one of the things that was super interesting was in on the continent in Europe, right during the Haitian revolution and directly after, most of the newspaper coverage of it was extremely positive was sort of like, yes, these people were, um, you know, this is a this is a beautiful sort of example of enlightenment thinking. This is a, this is on par with the American Revolution. Like we understand what this means sort of on the world stage. Um, that was sort of the the most of the press around it um, for for the maybe the four or five years after it. And even in the US, there was some favorable press of it. There's a um, uh, uh, John Adams had a copy of a biography of Toussaint Louverture in which he wrote something like, um, this is the bravest man in the Western hemisphere. So like Haiti was, was a promise and sort of had that part of the imagination. And because of that, um, you know, the US uh, powers that be continually, um, you know, tried to negate it as much as possible. Wow, thank you. Um, and then I guess the last, last question is from um, Jean Dolan. Um, I'm originally from Haiti and I have to say magnificent writing, Caitlin. I'd like to ask you, um, this is a question about the archive again. So how much um, materials or archival materials um, did you have access to that directly informed uh, your rendering of Liberty's life, thought processes or feelings so, such as letters or other documents and how much is just your own creative process? So the relationship between the imagination um, and, and not that they're at odds, imagination in the archive, but that maybe that they live next to each other and feed off each other. But yeah, um, they 100% they live next to each other and feed off each other for me. So I didn't have any primary source documents for, for um, Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart or her daughter. Her family had those letters back and forth, but I didn't have access to those. The closest thing that I had was um, uh, the doctor's, one of the doctor's husbands had traveled to Haiti in the 18th, uh, right after the Civil War, and kept a travel journal that's in the Schomburg. But when I went to go read it, it was on microfiche and it was in his handwriting and I literally could not make heads or tails of any of it. I, I tried to save as much as I could for one day when like maybe I'll, I'll have a research assistant who's really good at like reading script and can figure that out. But it was literally just scribbles on the page. The only thing I could make out was he had dr drawn a picture of a palm tree um, and with, with the inscription Port-au-Prince beside it in like August 1869 or something like that, which was really cool, but like not really um, helpful in, in constructing a narrative. So um, a lot of the Liberty stuff is from imagination. It's also reading um, as much of, uh, um, as much sort of like poetry and, and, and stuff to get the voice. So I read um, a lot, I, uh, the Song of Solomon in the Bible was a huge influence. So I read that um, many times. Um, and then I also read a lot of poetry and I tried to read, um, I got a, uh, this book of Haitian proverbs that, that was printed in the 1960s. It's called like 3,333 Haitian proverbs. I read that, <laughs> that a lot to just sort of like get an idea for language and imagery and all that kind of stuff. So that's um, where, pulling from the archive comes in. So the so I assumed you actually had access to those letters, but you had not, so that was all based on the oral history that kind of gave you mm -hmm. the gem of the, um, of the germ, I guess, of, of the, the, the story. And then you just went off and created. Yeah. Wow, that's so fascinating. Okay, that's amazing. Yeah. Are you curious about those letters at all or? Oh, <laughs> like... I'm so curious about them. Um, you know, I'm still in contact with some people at Weeksville and my old boss who was there, who did the, who was with me in that oral history, who did the oral history with, um, with Ellen Holly. Um, I talked to her a few weeks ago and she was like, oh, I, you know, I'm still have her email and stuff. So maybe somehow getting those letters, I tried to get in contact with her when the book was coming out. Um, or when we were doing the arcs like last year around this time, um, but it was the pandemic and I couldn't track down where she was and, and the few organizations she was involved with wouldn't give me her address. So hopefully I'll read those letters, but I have not yet. <clears throat> no, well, no, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I think we're about to, to wrap up. If anyone has any final 
questions, you can put it in the chat. Um, but this has been such a, I really love this book. So thank you so much for giving us this gift during um, this other time of, you know, we're coming out of a, a major a crisis and uh, a global pandemic and racial reckoning, but it's also a moment of um, possibility and, and unknownness. And so I think so much of your book is, is trying to make sense of, of that uncertainty and imbue it with, a, with the optimism that the people themselves had at the time. Um, even though, you know, we have a sense, like, I guess, what was it uh, that we make, what was the scientific method, the repeat and oh, fail, and fail, and repeat. Repeat. fail and repeat, yeah, yeah. fail and repeat, fail and repeat. So, um, so we're in some version of <laughs> the repeat. <laughs> class, so, so um, but um, yeah, thank you so much for spending your evening with us. Thank you all for attending. It's been a really well, um, attended conversation. And so I've always loved being back here at the Free Library of Philadelphia. Um, and Caitlin, I've, I've, I've been able to, to hear and read her work for a while now. So this is just a pleasure. Um, Laura, I don't know if you want to close this out or Caitlin, are there any final thoughts you would like to share? With, I would um, just say, um, since we are virtually in Philadelphia, I'm not with you guys in the city, that the city was a big part of the book as well. So um, that earlier the the sort of like gen opening scene of the novel is a is this man escaping from slavery through a coffin that is based on a woman in philadelphia who ran a um undertaking business um that was that doubled as a stop on the underground railroad um and sarah maps douglas who's a black woman abolitionist in um philadelphia and wrote a lot about what their abolitionist meetings were like as black women. And um, she inspired the scene that I read at the start of this. So Philadelphia is all throughout this novel as well. Um, and the Haitian population that was in Philadelphia from the time right after the revolution through the end of the civil war is a, is a big part of it as well, so. Yeah, thank you for reminding us that. So there's just so many, um, I mean, one of the lessons to take or one of the takeaways, I guess, from the book is that all of these um, moments of uh, these kind of potential births of freedom, right? Um, physical, uh, geographical, and in spiritual and intellectual. And then um, what one does with that, you know? And, and so again, we're in this moment where we really can have, um, we're having deep conversations about uh, our white supremacy um, and uh, gender equity. And so I think your book also kind of reminds us of like these free, uh, black women, these free black people who are trying to make their way through. Um, but what is it that we can take from their bravery and boldness and their, you know, their their attempts to to be, uh, to live the world, uh, live in the world on their own terms. I mean, they're just, it's such a heroic um, journey that we get to see over and over and over again in this book. So thank you so much for that as well. It looks like we can just say good night. So I'm gonna say good night to everyone. Um, and Caitlin, I'll give you the last, last, uh, thoughts here or last words. Oh, just good night. Thank you. This was a delight. Thank you. And and thank you for the wonderful questions too. I just really enjoyed it. And feel free to pick up the book um, at Joseph Fox Bookshop. And that's also in our uh, the chat. So you can get it there. So thank you everyone. Um, enjoy these wonderful summer days and please be safe and, and stay healthy. Bye. <laughs>